it's slightly strange to say what I'm about to say, but one issue that gives me hope for the future, even though it in a way contradicts history, which is always dangerous, is that we do have plenty of room to improve everywhere. This is the America's Quarterly Podcast. I'm Brian Winter. Here at America's Quarterly, we've spent the last few months trying to step back from the day-to-day crises the region always seems to face and understand what seems to be a cautiously optimistic moment for Latin American economies following a decade of stagnation. Where is growth coming from? And where is the region headed? Today, we thought we'd focused on one of the more positive cases, Brazil, where GDP growth is expected to top 3% this year. Important reforms are being discussed, such as tax reform, and where a modern economia verde, or green economy, seems to be tentatively taking hold. But just how sustainable is this faster growth? How successfully is the Lula government handling the country's still very real economic challenges? What are the long-term solutions, potentially, in areas like healthcare and education? We've invited one of Brazil's top policy minds, my friend Arminio Fraga, an economist and a former president of Brazil's central bank, as well as a prominent investor in the country. I can't think of a better guest. Arminio, welcome back to the America's Quarterly Podcast. Delighted to be here, uh, Brian. Thank you. Arminio, Brazil's economy has been a positive surprise so far in 2023 with better than 3% growth now forecast by the IMF in Lula's first year. What's your view on what's happening right now? The news on on the the headline number are good. A lot of that comes from a truly spectacular year in the world of agriculture and agribusiness in general. Other good news includes a significant drop in unemployment. The informal economy is still high. Uh, All of that is true, but all of it showed progress this year. So that's good. What is not clear is how sustainable this is, whether investment will kick in, whether we will do enough to um, do well in productivity issues where I believe there are amazing opportunities to improve. Not clear. All of those are still up in the air. And then there's the macroeconomic backdrop that is, I'd say, fragile. And the combination is one that still doesn't quite get the animal spirits animated. It's reminiscent, I guess, at some level of Lula's first year during his first presidency 20 years ago in 2003 when the agriculture sector started its long ascent, not just in Brazil, but in other countries around Latin America and indeed the world because of what was happening at the time in China. I mean, are you part of this group who thinks that Lula has been somewhat lucky for a second time, or do you think that he and his government deserve at least part of the credit for what's been happening so far? No, really, on the contrary. I think it's actually the whole story seems to be the mirror image upside down. Lula came in at the very beginning of a commodity price boom, and that was wonderful for Brazil, and and, and it was very helpful, and it lasted his eight years. But the main feature of his arrival was very simply that he he pretty much tossed in the trash can the Workers' Party economic program and followed a sort of commonsensical set of policies that clearly represented at that point a major, major, major relief, a major expectational positive surprise. And Now, I think what we saw was the opposite. He came in in a global environment that is nasty. No need to dwell on that. We're talking interest rates. We're talking China, Russia, now the the Middle East, global warming. It's really 
a very challenging environment. I can't think of one that was this bad in decades. And he surprised everyone by not repeating his basic logical approach to things. He, he came in talking about reforms that in practice would have been an avalanche of anti-reforms in many areas, he and his colleagues, social security, labor laws, even an area that has been a huge success, the new framework for investments in sanitation. They wanted to change that, etc. All of those uh, were quite scary, attacking the central bank, constantly talking about austerity as if Brazil was in a position to uh, not to be somewhat austere. But at the same time, you know, the rhetoric, certainly during those initial months during his government, frightened a lot of people in the markets and in the private sector generally. But the inflation target was maintained. He did ultimately, I mean, the Brazilian Central Bank is independent, but Lula didn't try to interfere in ways beyond rhetoric for the most part. The feeling that I get talking to people sometimes is that the rhetorical storm has passed and that it didn't leave much tangible damage in its wake. Do you, do you agree or disagree with that view? I think the, the storm has passed, but we're not seeing the sun yet. Yes, the thunder is gone. But it's still cloudy, and the overall development strategy is unclear, but it still kind of smells like old Brazil, the Brazil that didn't do so well. The Brazil of the famous flight of the chicken, which was a, a phrase that was coined to describe an economy that begins to take off but doesn't go very high before it comes back to Earth. I mean, is that where we are again? Yeah, that is actually a, an optimistic description because we have had pretty massive crashes. It's like the chicken didn't fly very high, but it crashed. You know, it crashed recently with with President Dilma Rousseff. It was amazing. It was, you know, the drop in GDP per capita that happened during the so-called lost decade took place in three years. So it's uh, it's very difficult to find a development path that delivers if every 10 years or so you blow up. It's interesting hearing you, though, because you, your tone sounds to me at least somewhat different from an economy that's growing at 3%. I mean, is the point here that you expect that 2024 and perhaps uh, the year or two after that to be more difficult? Yeah, I mean, the forecasts that, you know, they're often wrong, no, no, no question, but for growth over the next two, three years are, are modest. You know, people are talking one and a half percent. And you can see why for now. Still very high interest rates, no trust in, in the overall kind of macroeconomic policy. True, we've had some important reforms over the last few years, and we're now still talking about a very important one, namely tax reform. And perhaps over the next few years, we're going to see some of the impact of the labor reforms and other achievements of the last, I don't know, six years or so, but not enough to light a fire in the economy in a sustainable way, not enough to um, be too excited about where we're heading. So how, how would you describe or what's your understanding of the current political dynamic then right now? I mean, I, you've made clear that you believe Lula's not pursuing anything like the relatively pro-market mix of policies that he did during his first presidency 20 years ago. What do you think he has on his mind? What's driving him? What are the other considerations? What are the interest groups that are driving the current policy mix right now. You're a, a veteran observer, not only of Brazilian economics, but also politics as well. What's, how do you understand what he's doing right now? So I think he has slowed down on, on the rhetoric, as you put it. And 
he agreed with his finance minister in putting together a fiscal, you know, framework that is an improvement over what we had before. But it's still not enough to make us too excited. I believe we need to take a much deeper look at the spending side of government. And there's no constituency for that. Our politics are very fragmented, but the PT no longer has an alliance with, uh, you know, a manageable number of parties to do things. The so-called Centrão, the big center, is a very kind of bottom-up, kind of pork-barreling machine. They are an obstacle to um, whatever it is that the PT wants uh, done. But it's all very bottom-up. It doesn't address a massive, massive reprioritization of government spending that must be a part of any successful strategy that is left out. They're just looking at increasing taxes, some of which I'm totally in favor because they're totally absurdly regressive. They're trying to clean that up. They're not moving towards a super progressive taxation. They're just undoing the absurd regressiveness. So anyway, it's it's still, um, I don't think we, we have at this point the ingredients for accelerated growth uh, in place. It, it might be useful, Arminio, if you tell our audience a little bit your view about Brazil's fiscal framework, about its tax structure. Take a step back for a moment and give our audience your appraisal of, of why these frameworks are so problematic in Brazil? Let's break it down into a couple parts. One is, are we doing enough to stop the growth in the debt ratio of the government? This is very important because we're, we're moving back towards 80%, but unlike other countries in the world, and I guess at this point, not too many, but we still have interest rates that are significantly higher than the rate of growth in the economy. So this is, is, is unsustainable. And what was put in place was a very slow crawl towards a very small primary surplus. Not enough. And then number two, at a deeper level, what I just mentioned, there's still a crucial need to rethink the sp spending side of government. Almost 80% of government spending goes into the wage bill of government and social security. This number is a total outlier if you do an international comparison. And at the same time, we have areas that could use significantly more investment, including public. As you know, the private sector can do a lot, but it can't do all. And we have areas, for example, in, in healthcare, for example, in pretty much all aspects of infrastructure that would require some government spending, and there's no room for that in the budget. And then finally, what the budget has on the spending side is a range of growth that goes from about a half a percent to two and a half percent, but it grows in real terms. So it's a, an incomplete framework that won't deliver the low interest rates that ultimately would be the proof of the pudding. Would it be accurate then, Arminio, to say that part of what makes Brazil's economy uniquely troubled is a group of people who happen to be public sector workers who receive special salaries and privileges? I mean, is that the Brazilian problem in its essence? That's a Brazilian problem. Because you don't want to make it look like all the folks that are teaching grade school, public grade school, all the folks that are working on health care at the ground level, they're not overpaid. It's much more than that. A lot of it is not in the federal government, is in the cities. We start out with, we have too many of them. Each one has everything, local chamber, local this and that and the other. Then we have similar issues at the state level, similar issues at the judiciary where there are many absurdly high uh, 
compensation packages. And I would say similarly in, in the legislative because of so many, we have so many, so many cities as well. So you really have to look at the whole thing and that makes it difficult to solve. But, but yes, that is an issue because a lot of money goes there that could go elsewhere, particularly in the investment front. And some of it could be there to help lower interest rates. The central bank clearly alone will not be able to do the job without risking, you know, inflation um, going up again. Yeah, because to be clear, Brazil spends a lot, but Brazil also collects an awful lot of taxes. You know, that's exactly right. But I also give you a number. I mentioned government investment at its high point, about 30, 40 years ago, public investment was close to 5% of GDP and it's around 1% now. It's a massive drop. Massive spending on Social Security, absurd. Massive spending on the wage bill, absurd. Very low level of investment spending by the government, also absurd. So, you know, we, we, there's some work to be done there. You mentioned earlier, Arminio, that Brazil's a politically fragmented country where everybody wants to spend. You could have been describing the United States, a lot of European countries as well. I mean, we live in a moment where the expansion of the state seems to be the rule of the day, including, again, to be clear, in some countries that really need it. I often joke that I, you know, Latin America is so diverse and so different that I, I, my joke is that I sound like sometimes like a neoliberal when I talk about Brazil or Argentina, a social democrat when I talk about Mexico or Chile, and a communist when I talk about Guatemala, because, you know, there's such a huge diversity there in, in state size. But w the point is that, you know, we look at big thinkers of the day, like um, Marina Mazzucato, the Italian economist who's in vogue right now. I mean, this is somebody who's advocating for an expansion of the state. Joe Biden in the United States. I mean, uh, that's sort of the zeitgeist right now. It's hard to imagine this government in Brazil going in the opposite direction. Yeah, no, but we followed her advice that I, I don't support. Government spending 40 years ago or so was a quarter of GDP. It's now a third. There was no austerity here. You're talking about in, in Brazil, that ratio has gone from a quarter of GDP to a third of GDP. Yes. And by the way, I, I'm out here debating this issue all the time. And I'm, of the, I'm not of advocating reducing the size of the state. I'm just advocating using the money better. But I think we're such an unequal society that we will not fix that with the market alone. It's a very simple thing. So if you say... I was never a neoliberal President Cardozo that you know well wasn't either, exactly because of these needs. And, and moreover, I, I happen to think that in Brazil's case, investing in health, education, infrastructure would not only be socially desirable, but it would also allow us to grow more. So I, I, I think it's, this is a no-brainer, but we don't seem to get our act together to do that. I want to shift gears a bit and talk about institutions in Brazil. You were part of a vocal group of private sector leaders who, during the 2022 election, campaigned in Lula's favor, saying that Jair Bolsonaro was a danger to Brazilian democracy and Brazilian institutions. What's your evaluation of where we stand nearly a year later? Are you, do you think that Brazilian democracy is in good shape? Do you think that the quality of institutions has improved under Lula? I think they, they have improved, far from perfect. But I do think the institutions are working. What bothers me is, is this sensation that we don't seem to learn, not only from our mistakes, but also from things that we've done well. We, all, we seem to forget all the time about what works and what doesn't work, not just in the economy. But right now, I think, you know, we're taking, a, for instance, take our most visible feature, the Amazon. I think the Lula government is serious about doing something important there. Do you mean in terms of conservation of the forest or in terms of this idea of a economia verde, a, a green economy? Do you mean both? Uh, what, what do you have in mind? I mean both in the following sense. First, in whatever 
connects to climate change, biodiversity, etc. Yes. But beyond that, I see the government talking about energy transition as a integral part of their economic strategy. And I think that is wonderful. And I don't see why we won't go at some point towards a kind of New Zealand, Costa Rica, let's turn this place into a green paradise. This is not just for tourists that would, of course, be delighted to show up in large numbers, but also for us. I'm thinking quality of life. I think at some point people here are going to understand that this affects their life, their happiness, their self-image, their pride, all of that, all the above. I, I think the government has this in mind. On the economic side, don't see very clearly where we're heading. But on a lot of these issues, yes, I do see we're breathing a sigh of relief. And as much as I would like to see better economic policies, the rest is okay. It's definitely night and day versus what we were trying to avoid. Referring to Bolsonaro, I mean, what do you think is necessary to win that argument? Because one of the interesting things about the 2022 election was that the areas that saw some of the greatest deforestation under Bolsonaro were also the areas that voted most enthusiastically for Bolsonaro in 2022, areas of the, the Amazon where, you know, Bolsonaro often got upwards of 60 or even 65 percent of the vote. And what that tells you, unfortunately, in my view and, and yours as well, is that the people in that region continue to believe in at least some of them in a slash and burn model, thinking that that will benefit them and improve their bottom line. I know that this green economy subject is one where you've done a lot of thinking and a lot of advocacy over the last few years. How do, you, how do you win that argument? I think you win by, by delivering, you know, quality of life, jobs, pride. And it's easier said than done, but there's no other way. I think it's the, you know, the proof of the pudding, right? You, you, you just have to show that this is a better system. I do believe that in, as it relates to the Amazon, we are looking at nearly 30 million people. We are now telling them you can no longer cut trees and burn, do a slash and burn type of, of, of strategy. That never delivered many jobs anyway, but they're there and they're Brazilians and they're people or they're suffering. And we need to have a strategy that includes dealing with that. Arminio, in this complicated political and economic landscape that you've described, where, from an investor point of view, do you think the best opportunities are in Brazil right now? There is enormous demand for capital in pretty much every dimension of infrastructure. I do think in all the areas that I think qualify as social investments that I've alluded to here today, there is room for capital, private capital to invest. And uh, Brazil is large enough, really, Brian, to offer opportunities pretty much everywhere. I say this not to evade the question, it's an important question, but I think it's more about the size of the overall investment cake than the kind of the, all the flavors. Armenia, let me conclude here by asking about a forward-looking question on a subject that I know is very important to you, and which you mentioned earlier, two areas actually, healthcare and education. You've looked at both of these areas a lot as an academic and as a public intellectual, if you don't mind me using that term. In just a couple of minutes here, I mean, wh where do you think the room for improvement is and and how do, we, how do we get there? So in education, we made a major move over the last three, about 30 years. And most of our kids are now in school, but they're lagging as far as what grade level they're at and the quality of, of our education system 
needs to improve a whole lot. So in education, I think, is a quality issue. It does reflect social conditions, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, we need to do a lot better on the quality angle. Health, the primary care government system has done very well for us over the years. We have spectacular results in, in, in the world of vaccination, of smoking, uh, and so on. But it still, I'd say, lacks money in many ways. And it's, it still has features that resemble the U.S. We were supposed to be like the U.K., probably 80% public, 20% private. And we're probably 55% private, more than the U.S. And... I think this deserves some rethinking. I, I chair an institute that is focused on health policy. Um, we're working on this uh, along with many people. And I think there's a lot of work to do there as well. So those are two areas where we have a lot of room to improve. And I, and I probably should end on this note. I think that it's slightly strange to say what I'm about to say, but one issue that gives me hope for the future, even though it in a way contradicts history, which is always dangerous, is that we do have plenty of room to improve everywhere. Armenia, on that note, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Delighted. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the America's Quarterly Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review, give us a rating, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. The America's Quarterly Podcast is produced by Luisa Franco and edited in partnership with Human Group Media.